I mean, inevitably, it was the decision that, that had to be made. If they haven't come up with a better solution, I don't think a few guys who solve Rubik's Cubes for fun are going to find a better solution as well. Do you think you would do it all again the same way? You end up joining the World Sports Organizational Team. So that's a team that is dedicated to, you know, the World Cube Association is the government, governing body of all Rubik's Cube competitions. And that team is dedicated to try to, you know, make speed cubing a recognized sport by the international olympic committee right yeah yeah so how did you kind of get involved with that and what is kind of your role there yeah so it was back in 2022 and i was starting to get a bit more involved in cubing um i'd when i was living in new zealand at the time i was organizing competitions and then i was uh mo traveling around a bit um but then i saw that there was this opportunity to join this new team which uh, Ethan Pride was heading, who's uh, a board member as well. And I know him personally. Um, and I thought, I'm really passionate about pushing the the sport of speed cubing and trying getting it as like competitive as possible. And I, I think it was at the Oceanics and I had a, a chat with him um, because I'm pretty sure the, sub, the applications were still open at that time. And he was like, yeah, definitely apply. It'll be great. Um, so we actually had, we actually had an in-person interview because I was in Melbourne at the time. And I think Felix was present as well. We just went to a pub and had a chat for a couple hours. Um, so that was quite funny. Um, but yeah, so I guess early on, obviously our goal, our, our big, big goal, which is going to take a while to get there, um, is, yeah, we want to be recognized by all of the, the big, like, sporting governing bodies, like mainly the International Olympic Committee, um, main reason is we don't want to be part of the Olympics. That's like not something we're aiming for. But the International Olympic Committee, they like basically state what is a sport. And if your if your hobby or whatever is a sport, it means you can get government grants, you can get discounts on venues, um, all of these sorts of things. Uh, mainly the government grants is a big thing. Like if you want to host the world championship, the government might go, okay, here, here's a few hundred grand to help you run that because you're running a sport where if you're just a non-profit organization, governments aren't so really bothered about that. And it's a lot harder to get the kind of financial aid you need to host a world championships. Um, so that's our like big goal, but we've got a lot of steps to get there. We've got to um, make sure our governing is all good, make sure everyone knows what they're doing in the team, uh, the right information is out there. So there was, I think at the time there was five of us, there was Ethan and then four team members. And the fir first couple of jobs we were given, there was, we had to, one of the teams had to evaluate the governing procedures and all of that. I wasn't part of that. And then another big job we had, um, which was partially it was to become international, uh, like a, to help become recognized by the IOC and partially for other reasons. Um, but we had the big problem of Taiwan was listed as a country on the WCA and if you look at the Olympics or any popular sports, the name Taiwan isn't mentioned. And that's because China doesn't like the name Taiwan being mentioned. And China's a big, a big country and they have a lot of power. Um, so we're like, okay, if we want to be an internationally recognized sport, it's going to be hard to do that if we've got the name Taiwan floating about, because then China are going to be like, I don't want to be involved with this. Um, and then as well as that, we were hearing from Chinese delegates and organizers that they were essentially, they didn't want to organize competitions because there was the threat of the police get intervening because they would see Taiwan, the name Taiwan being involved with the competition. And they'd be like, that's anti-China propaganda. You can't be doing that. So then it was like a risk for volunteers to run competitions. So there was no competitions going on. So we kind of had to, we were trying to kind of tr trying to kill two birds with one stone and it was a very tough thing to do we spent a lot of time deliberating um but eventually we looked at every other sport in the world and saw what they did and we're like if they haven't come up with a better solution i don't think a few guys who solve rubik's cubes for fun are going to find a better <laughs> solution as well i mean even governments can't figure this thing out um but that was yeah that was very tough a very tough time back in in 2022 having to deal with all that uh, the community backlash was was difficult. It was understandable, uh, be, being a very like heavy political topic, 
and I mean it I we did what what I goes against my political beliefs as well and I think everyone in the team doesn't feel this way politically which was a bit tough but we had to put the the benefit of the WCA against our beliefs um which was tough but it was it was a good challenge and I, and I learned a lot from it yeah, totally. I, I kind of felt a little bad for you because I feel like everyone kind of targeted <laughs> you randomly for it all. Yeah. Um, even though there was I, a lot yeah. of, many people on the decision, but it seemed like a lot of hate was directed, you know, towards you, at least in like the forums and stuff. And yeah, like, I think it was just because I was like a no name, like the rest of the guys in the team, like Sean Moran was in the team, but he was less involved with that decision. Um, and yeah, and he's quite well known. But I think I was a lot one of the guys trying to keep up with the, the emails and the forum comments and i was known before so just like a lot of the criticism got got thrown my way <laughs> i mean looking back at what it's all done with like you know a lot of like chinese competitions came back in like full-fledged motion you have you know many competitors like yi hang and you know ru hang and all these competitors coming back and able to solve and it's honestly you see a giant growth in the chinese keeping community yeah. post decision do you think you would do it all again the same way if we did it again, we would probably come to the same decision, but the way we got there would be different. I think we'd definitely spend a lot more time deliberating with the community, making sure like our plans for how we're going to announce it all and the information we're going to release would be a bit different. Um, hopefully that would, would have relinquished a bit of the backlash. But I mean, inevitably, like it was the decision that, that had to be made. It was a tough decision, but we did we did have to do it. Um, but interesting about like the Chinese competitions coming back is there's still actually not that many because in the the big gap where they were allowed to start hosting events again, but they weren't allowed to host or they didn't want to host WCA events. Um, obviously, speedcubing is still massive in China. So lots of other unofficial organizations started popping up. So I saw an interview with Antoine Cantin and he's saying there's like, he reckons there's about 40 competitions a weekend happening all across China. Um, and I can't imagine, like, imagine if WCA didn't come back, like there'd be even more. Um, and at least that since WCA competitions are there, we still have like some integrity. Because imagine, like, this is the problem, right? If there was no WCA competitions in China, and the fastest beekeepers in the world are in China, which they are, they're they're probably going to start being not incentivized to go to like Malaysia and these other Chinese, uh, these other Asian countries to compete and break records. They're just going to start going, oh, well, these Chinese competitions, these are the world records now. And they're going to start breaking sub four, sub three barriers in China. And all of a sudden, the whole WCA loses its integrity, right? Because the whole thing is we are the world records. We have the rankings and all of that. And if there's organizations in China with faster results and all of the top competitors competing there, all of a sudden we can't say we have the world record. We can't say we have the top 100 rankings. Um, but it's still a bit iffy now. I don't really know if there's any sort of databases of um, like Chinese world records or Chinese rankings from these unofficial competitions, but at least they have the option to compete in China, just not quite as infrequently as we'd like. Yeah, totally. And I'm just kind of curious, like, when you're making a decision to de-recognize Taiwan and stuff, what does that process look like? You know, is it something where you're in direct communication with the board? Is it something where it's, like, within WSOT itself that you guys are, you know, internally talking that you present it to the board? Like, how was that decision made and how was it finalized? Yeah, so it started with, like, internal talks within WSOT and with, like, Ethan, our leader, who's also a... Um, a board member and we we put together like a proposal of we we were sent a lot of information and we tried to contact like the taiwanese delegate but we didn't hear back unfortunately um and we put together a proposal and then we sent that to the board and it's like this is the situation this is what we think needs to be done um and that was sent to the board they then voted on it and said like yes we agree and i think ethan was keeping them like in the loop the entire time and then from that it was just about like okay how do we announce this 